would have you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're continuing our study in the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. It is the church at Ephesus that Paul is directing his attention to. Salvation, individual and corporate. And we've subtitled this study, The Unity That Believers Have in Christ Brings Unity in the Church, Which Is the Body of Christ. This is sermon number 128. And this section we have entitled, Walking in the Wisdom of Christ. And this is part Three, Ephesians 5, if you will, beginning at verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Shall we look to the Lord our God in prayer? Our holy God, we thank you for the privilege we've had to come once again to study your holy word. We ask now, O God, that you would bless us. Bless us, O God, to know your truth, that we might put it to practice in our lives, that we may honor you in all these things. We ask, O Holy Father, bless us, you encourage us, you strengthen us in these things. Now give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive that which thy word and spirit would teach us in Christ's name. Amen. The Apostle has made us very aware of those world religions and philosophies, customs, practices that are found among the foolishness of their age and our age as well. Those false religions, world and life views that appeal to the flesh, permitting and excusing worldly pleasures among people. Yet in reality, they have done much more than just to derail some who have professed the faith of Christ. They have caused utter failure in the purpose that God gives to his believers in walking in the wisdom of Christ. We are to be attentive, he tells us in this section. He's telling us that true Christians walk in the wisdom of Christ. They do not walk in the wisdom of this world, but they walk in the wisdom that Christ hath given to us. That mind of Christ, I remind you that Paul speaks of in chapter 4, having that one true faith is found in the written word of the living God. And thus, as Paul gives directive here, these are not options, but they are mandates. This is how the believer is to live before God. And we are to be attentive to what has been given us in the directives of our faith and how we ought to practice them. Thus the apostle pushes his admonition and exhortation even harder into the area of the Christian life and walk to ensure that we do not get caught up, that we do not synthesize a worldly life view in the practice of Christianity. As Paul says in Colossians, there is traditions of men and philosophies that are vain from this world. Do not get caught up into them. They do not follow the philosophy and the world and life view of Christ. We are to walk, be established in our faith, walk in Christ. All the days of our life. Well, if you will, I want us to turn our attention today to verse 18 of this fifth chapter. Listen, if you will, to what the Apostle Paul says. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled 
with the Spirit. Note, if you will, in the first clause, and do not be drunk with wine. Here you have the term drunk. Methosko, from the Greek, which is an old verb meaning intoxicated. The apostle speaks here of the sin of drunkenness, of excess. It may well be an allusion to the Dionysian mystery religions, of which he's already spoken about, these mystery religions. This mystery cult used intoxicants to remove ethical inhibitions and social constraints in their life, liberating the individual, as it were, in order that they might return to the most natural state of their depravity. As it were, bringing out the true man, as some have said philosophically in their writings. This liberation, this casting off of restraints, also led to all manner of excessivenesses in their lives. In time, the culture of Greek society, such drunkenness had become a custom and a habit among the people. It's a voluntary exercise in which excessive drinking or of any kind that has that ability to alter one's mind, to disturb it, as it were, through the use of strong drink, is what Paul is is attacking at this point. Why? Because this allowed the mind to become distressed, thereby depriving of the use of reason, clear thinking, rendering the individual of making rational decisions in their life. One of the great requirements of Christianity is to always be confronting, reasoning, understanding, living in the reality of our time, understanding that we are not to be taken away from the world in which we are to be focused to be gone, and thereby missing what is important to us, and how that we are to interact with the world we live in. And today we have it in many forms. For we have many vices that allow us to escape the reality of the world in which we live. A reality that we ought to be addressing, which we are not addressing. And that has become prevalent in our society today. But here, Paul picks upon that which is one of the best known abuses in Greek society. Although wine is only mentioned in the context of our passage of Scripture, because wine was the usual alcoholic drink in the eastern countries, Nevertheless, the principle of what he is saying holds true of any excessive or abusive alcoholic drink other than just wine. However, the drinking of wine or liqueur for necessary use is not prohibited. It can be used for drinking when one is sick in order that one may feel better. The scripture says, drink a little wine for thy stomach sank nor is it prohibited for honest delight and lawful pleasure. The Bible simply does not condemn its use, but it does unequivocally condemn it for its abuse. Now, I thought about taking the time to go into a very long diatribe just about wine, but I did not find that I thought it would be helpful at this time. It better be a standalone subject that I will address at some point because it's very intricately wove throughout the Scripture and it will take a lot of time to really look at all of the texts that deal with the question of the use and practice of 
strong drink, what is acceptable and prohibited in Scripture, in order for one to say, we have exhausted the very meaning that God has given to us on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in the life of a believer. But here Paul has really just emphasized one thing that was really common. This excessive or abusive drinking of wine and its prohibition. Last persons may be overtaken and become intoxicated and incapable of maintaining their Christian perspective. So easy to step over the line. As a matter of fact, it's one of the reasons you will see why God says for us to stay out of those circumstances where people don't have those ethical norms, where abuses will take place, wherein we would be encouraged to step over that line. And so it is that while this is the custom and the habit of excessive practice that Paul is speaking about, it is not just a single act that has taken place, but it's a series of actions, a course of living in this sinful behavior that dominates a man and demonstrates that he is one who is counted as a drunkard, according to Scripture. There is no question that this sin is very sinful. It is one of the works of the flesh. Its season of pleasure eventually turns into a devastation of lifestyle. It is opposed to walking honestly before the Lord. That's why Paul is addressing it. You're to be walking in the wisdom of Christ. How can you do that if you are imbibing in an excessive thing that will take you away from thinking and walking in the wisdom of Jesus Christ? We are to be walking honestly before the Lord, having the mind of Christ, thinking those directives and exhortations given to us from the Scripture that we might honor God in everything that we think and do to his glory and honor. Well, listen, if you will, to the Apostle Paul in Romans 13. Here he gives additional instruction, beginning at verse 13. Let us walk properly. This walk, by that, of course, he means your Christian lifestyle. Let us live properly, if, if you will, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Note this, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Now this is the danger to which these Ephesian Christians were being exposed and a corruption which many of their fellow citizens around them were greatly addicted to, living under the mastery of sin. They seen it. They lived with him. You can't be a Christian and not live in this world, but we're not to live as the world lives. That's the teaching of Scripture. Now, there are many commentators who believe it's not improbable that this verse is also allusion to the drunken debaucheries of Bacchus, the pagan god of wine, and whose honor the festivals were given. It was during those festivals that men and women regarded it as an acceptable act of worship to become intoxicated and with wild songs in Christ, run through the streets and fields and vineyards, involving themselves in acts of debauchery. This is the way the pagan seen himself as worshiping and serving Bacchus, the god of wine, that Greco-Roman god, 
It was worship in both Greek and Roman society. Well, perhaps this explains the apostle's exhortation that he will go on and we'll be taking a look at next Lord's Day to the concept of singing and the exaltation of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our heart as being much more appropriate modes of devotion to God, having the Christian's worship stand out in very distinct contrast with the wild and dissolute habits of the pagans of their day. This we might never completely be able to establish or know. But we at least can say there is a point in which that contrast would clearly be drawn here. But what I want to, you to be aware of is this. It was not uncommon at the times of the early church that the church found itself also entangled in the practices that are unbecoming of Christ. They, too, struggled with sin. At times, clearly, they became intoxicated. Well, it was a part of their past. But it was positively forbidden. All intoxication is prohibited in the Scripture. There is no excuse for intoxication. It does not matter by what means the intoxication is produced. It is forbidden. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, again, Paul, showing the consistency and coherency of his systematic thinking and laying out these doctrinal principles of practice in the Christian life. Listen to what he says at verse 11. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. Note the context here. This is within the church. Not just the world. We're going to be around the world. You can't escape that if you're in the world, apart from dying and leaving the world. But now he points to the church, and these directives are to the church, and now he makes a directive and says, I have written that you do not keep company with anyone named a brother. He who professes Christ who says he is a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, who what? Who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reveal of reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Do not be drunk with wine. And if you know of those who abuse such things and they call themselves a brother, don't associate with them. Do not even eat with them because their actions are unworthy of Christ, Jesus our Lord. How emphatic can you get? The Apostle Paul is very emphatic about it. He gives these directives saying there are no choices here. There are no options. Oh, well, if he's a nice guy, but he just imbibes too much. What happens when you begin to compromise the standards of Christianity? You compromise them in one place, they begin to compromise in every other area. And pretty soon that which is unacceptable becomes a standard of, and then we give it a weird name. Well, you know, he's a carnal Christian. He has all the carnality practices of life that are forbidden by Scripture, but he says he's a believer. And we live with that. How can that be? It cannot. Therefore, he who practices lawlessness even if he claims to be a brother, don't fellowship with him and don't eat with him. What is that? 
being mean? No, it's a rebuke. Brother, you're in sin. You need to repent of your sin. You need to embrace the principles of Christ in your life if you want to fellowship with us. Well, then Paul goes on in this verse and he says, in which is dissipation. Now, there have been many different opinions as to the word that is rendered here as excess. Excess, excuse me. Asotea, from the Greek. Asotea occurs only in two other places in the New Testament, which I think is quite interesting. Which is rendered there as riot. You get the idea? Riot, n- riotousness. Listen to what Paul says in Timothy 1.6. If a man is blameless and the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot, or literally dissipation, acting, if you will, in an unruly manner, or in a manner of being in excess. What is the Christian called to be? Moderate in all the things that he does. Not excessive in any area, but control of his life. Not allowing sin to master him, but he mastering sin in his life. Not accused of riot, dissipation, or insubordination. Being unruly with it. No access, no unruliness. First Peter 4.4 4. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of riot or dissipation. Speaking, therefore, what? Evil of you. They speak evil of you because you are not like them. Why are you not like them? Because you have been transformed, given a new mind, you have put on the mind of Christ, and you are living by the directives of the word of the living God. God has told you how to moderate your life before him. Well, the meaning of this is that all that follows the excessive use or abuse of intoxicants, where there are excesses of anything in your life. It leads to all other kind of excessive practices in your life. When you break at one point, you begin to break at all points. John Calvin wrote here, and I quote, The meaning, therefore, is that drunkards throw off quickly every restraint of modesty or shame. That where wine reigns, licentiousness naturally follows. And consequently, that all who have any regard to moderation or decency ought to avoid and abhor drunkenness, unquote. Which is what? Dissipation. The excessiveness in the life of the believer. And in particular here, the use of alcoholic beverage. There is to be no excessiveness. And that one which breaks down all inhibitions to life. A person who gets intoxicated, their ethics go out the door. No inhibitions, no social constraints, no ethical boundaries when they have lost their ability to reason. And from there, if they do not stop the excessive practice of abusing alcoholic beverage, their life falls apart miserably, as well as all others around them. Well, then Paul continues out the end of this verse with saying, but be filled with the Spirit. Just the opposite. You want truly to be filled with something? Let it not be wine. 
but let it be the Holy Spirit of God. Thus he's saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. How much more appropriate to Christians to be filled by the Holy Spirit and to be filled with some intoxicant and to be parting out their lives without care concerning the world and their duties and how as Christians they ought to be responding to the demands of Scripture and the advancement of the kingdom of God. Let Christians when about to indulge in a glass of wine or strong drink, carefully think of this admonition by the apostle concerning excess. Let them remember that their bodies should be the temple of the Holy Spirit and that they must not be excessively filled with anything intoxicating them apart from the idea of being filled by the Holy Spirit of God. The Christian must not be driven into error by intoxication or drunkenness, wherein he ruins his own life and the life of others. We're told in Isaiah 28, 7, but they also have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Here you have Isaiah's exhortation. What happens when you become excessive? When you are not moderate? The things that God has given us the responsibility of be moderate in all things. Whether we eat or whether we drink, we do them to the glory of God, not in excess. Listen to him. They have erred through wine, through intoxicating drink. Even the priests and the prophets have erred because of the intoxicating drinks. They have become swallowed up by wine. The wine has eaten them up. They err in their vision in what it is that they have been called to do. And they stumble in the judgments that they are required to make. What we must ask, was any man ever made a better Christian by abusing intoxicating drinks? Of course not. It cannot be. Such Christian liberty is not to be taken lightly by either the weaker brother or the stronger brother. One must be careful not to be enticed to enter in what might have been or become a besetting sin in their life. Therefore, the exercise of Christian liberty for some to be able to drink wine but do it in moderation must be considered. And those who cannot do it in faith and control it in their life cannot participate in it. Listen to Paul, Romans 14, verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, talking about eating food sacrificed to idols, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. It's okay for the Christian to drink wine, to have an intoxicating drink, to have alcohol, in essence. It's not okay to use it in excess. We are to participate by faith. We are to believe by faith. We are doing what is right before God and according to the standards God has given us. But the principle there applies to all of the other areas of our life. Are we not to regulate every other area as well by faith? We do not think within the context of the world and life view we are to be living in as Christians. How that our 
principles of our faith and how we are to view things in this world that we live ought to all be moderated by the very law that God has given to us in governing and ordering our life. That's why he's talking to us here about walking in the wisdom of Christ, not the world, not Christ in the world, just Christ. We cannot be overtaken by excess. We cannot let sin master us. And anything that controls us, anything that has swallowed us up into ex excesses. The Westminster Divines wrote in chapter 20, we cannot partake thereof. You abuse it, you have no right to use it. None whatsoever. Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says at verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. You're not under the condemnation of the law. You've been freed by the grace of God to live to the standard that God in Christ has called you. That is what we are being called to do. That is walking in the wisdom of Christ. That's what Paul wants us to understand. These exhortations that he's giving to us here of how to put on the Christian principles of life, applying those doctrines, the purposes of God revealed from ages past of bringing redemption and salvation both to the Jew and to the Greek does not differ. We have been given purpose, meaning in this life, told how we ought to interact with this life and what the standards of righteousness are for us as we who profess faith in Jesus Christ. But not just in one area. But the principle of one applies to all. Every area of your life. Every area of your life is to be brought under the authority of the Word of God. Sin is not to have mastery over you, but you are to master your sins. That's the principle behind the mortification of sin in the life of a believer. Putting sin to death in your life, putting on the righteousness of God and His law in Christ to live unto Him. To be the moderated Christian in all that we seek to do that God would be glorified. Well, let me just, if I could, direct your attention in conclusion here to Proverbs 23. I think it's an interesting proverb to say the less, at least in verse 29 it begins. <clears throat> Listen to what the writer of Proverbs says. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Now think about it. He's asking the question, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Who is the one who has woe, sorrow, contentions, complaints, wounds without cause, redness of eyes? He says, 
those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Mixed wine here being the fact that often the wines were mixed with various things and the wine almost became like a super intoxicant for one who would partake of it. And as one gets intoxicated and becomes an abuser and is under its control, the wine always has that beautiful appearance as if it speaks to the individual. And probably in their own mind, they hear it. Look at me. Drink me. Make your pains go away. Forget about the problems. But in reality, he says, those who do these things, they're the ones that have all these problems in their life. And the problem has come from the fact they are caught up in the abuse itself. They're addicted and they cannot bring themselves away from that intoxication. Listen to him. He goes on. Do not look on the wine when it is red. The idea of being here that one is desiring it. The beauty, the luster of wine in its most perfected form. When it sparkles in the cup. And by the way, it doesn't mean literally sparkle. It means when it's to us, it brings that desire. It says to us, here is the relief. Here's where I get the comfort. And I can let go of all the problems that are in my life. And it's the very thing that brings the problem to the life. When it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who's drunk or been drunk yourself, but that's a perfect example of what goes on in the drunk's life. He sees strange things, he reasons irrational, and his heart utters perverse things. He's addicted. He's an abuser. He's an alcoholic. He's a drunk. Whatever you want to call him. He goes on. Yes. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea. Or like one who lies at the top of a mast saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? This is the man who has given his life to the excess. It controls him. What does he look forward to when he awakes? Another drink. Sin has mastered him. It's destroying him. It's destroying his life. We must be careful. That's what Paul's exhortation here is. He didn't say, don't drink wine. He says, do not be drunk with wine. All things in moderation. Whether you eat or drink, the scripture says, do all things to the glory of God. Do it in moderation. Do it in a way that honors God, that shows that you master your life to the glory of God in beating down your sins, seeking to root them out, to kill them, to destroy them. That's walking in the wisdom of Christ. That's walking and the wisdom that Christ has given us from his word. That is our duty and responsibility before God. 
in all things, whether it be an alcoholic drink or anything else, whether it be in medication, whether it be in anything, do it in moderation. Whether it be other areas of your life, do it in moderation. Do not let anything become your master. Save Jesus Christ. Live to the standards that He has called us to. Be filled with the Spirit of God. When we are filled with the Spirit of God, we will live by the standards of God's righteousness. That's what God has called you to be as a Christian. That's what he meant when he said, have the mind of Christ. Be of one mind. Be of one faith. Be of one life. The life that you live. Let it be coming of Jesus Christ. So I exhort you, let us take care to be moderate in all that we do that we may show that it is Christ who lives and governs in us through His Spirit to the standard of His righteousness and not to the standards of the pagan world around us. Let us not synthesize the culture of this world with Christianity, but let us keep our doctrine and our practices pure before God. Shall we pray?